before we get rolling, uh, I said we could change the exam to Wednesday because I thought you guys would make a review session. That looks out like that's a problem. Uh, we can move the exam back to Monday if that's easier for you. I, I don't care if it's Monday or Wednesday. I mean, do you all have a preference? Or Friday? No, <laughs> <laughs> or, or not. Oh, Friday. That's, I thought you yeah, yeah. No, no, no. So the reason Monday might be better now is I'm willing to do a review session of the weekend if, if that's something that works for you all. I'm good. Uh, let's say I won't get too much trouble here. Uh, why don't we say Sunday at? Let me tentatively now uh, now say the problem is can you guys get into the buildings on the weekends? Yes. I'm busy on Sundays, but you don't have to play around me. Are you busy all day Sunday? Um, I don't work on Sundays. Oh, Sunday. okay, gotcha. All right. Uh, what about Saturday? Uh, you don't have to play around me though. That's great. Uh, you know, I hate to be selfish, but I want to watch football. So how about Saturday at like 10 o'clock? After this weekend, I won't watch any more football. I think Saturday works great. Okay, we'll say Saturday at 10. Yeah. Is that is that okay? <laughs> Saturday at 10. Why would you do it at 6 p.m.? That'd be a wild funny session. I got it, I got it here on a Saturday. Okay, so what we'll do is <laughs> so you guys can get into Martin Hall, right? Yes. Okay, I, this is you know what? I'm gonna roll the dice that I wonder if I wonder if I'm gonna be able to get into this. Okay, here's what we're gonna do. Uh you know if you can get in the long haul? No. I didn't know you can get in the long haul. Because my office is in the long. Oh, there you go. So you others might have. See, what I'm worried about is over here in Martin, I'm worried that uh, the door might be locked. I, I I don't know if they do that anymore. So what we can do is why don't we meet at the classroom at 10 o'clock on Saturday? If that doesn't work, then we'll roll on over the long. I know there's a classroom that can get into there. Now, for you out there in Etherland, uh, when I get to the classroom, I'll, I'll obviously I'll turn on the Zoom so that you can participate. So let's all cross our fingers that the technology actually works on the weekend. I'm not too sure how confident I am about that. But we'll say 10 a.m. on Saturday. Okay. And then we'll have the exam Monday. Is that what we'll discuss it? I, I, I assume it's math on Monday. Okay, uh, so uh, where are we? Okay, any any questions? Okay, so uh, here's where we are right now. Uh, we were just talking about uh, we talked about normal series, subnormal series, normal series. Uh, and we just talked about what a refinement of a series is when we uh, kind of uh, insert a new uh, factor or insert a new group in the, uh, in the series. Um, let me give you a definition here. And this is kind of, this, is, this will sort of motivate all the, why are we talking about this kind of thing? And I'll show you some connections to solvability too. Um, definition. Uh, so, so, uh, and I'll let you speak like him. Uh, this is a, uh, a subnormal series. So what this means is this is just a, uh, a sequence of groups that each contain each other. And each GI plus one is normal in the previous one, right? Uh, we don't say that they're all normal in G0, but each one's normal in the previous one. 
this thing is called number one a composition system. If e quotient is simple. Okay, so we, we call this a composition series. When you take this quotient, uh, each successive quotient is simple. And two, it's called uh, a solvable series. Okay, so these adjectives just so you've got your subnormal series. So, and the reason we need subnormals is because we need these GI plus one to be normals for this to make sense. These are just more descriptive, right? Uh, we say that subnormal series is a composition series, each successive quotient is simple. And actually, we'll see what that means because you really can't break it down any further. And a solvable series, each factor is zero. So, here is a theorem. That one will kind of sketch through the details of this a little bit. Let you be a group. Uh, one and Q is fine. And Q has a composition series. Uh, number two, every refinement. Solvable series is solvable. So if you take a solvable series and you refine it further, it's still a solvable series. And three, uh, a subnormal series is a composition series if and only if it has no proper refinement. Uh, okay. So uh, let's. Uh, I wrote this down. To prove that. Uh, let me let's let's do it. Okay. Uh, let's see. Anybody picture why any fine group has a composition series? Uh, right. If G is non-identity and simple, then there's this composition series, right? Because this is normal in this, and the quotient is simple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. If not, then have normal simple. Now, if this is simple, then I'm done refining this. And if the quotient is simple, I'm done refining this. But otherwise, so look at, look at, so let's look at uh, G mod N here. Well, 
whole sample. Because there's your compositions. Right? If either of them is not simple, you just continue this process. Uh, if G, so for example, If it's not simple, then there is a proper normal subgroup of G mod N that actually strictly contains this. Right? So if G is not simple, then it has a normal subgroup in between itself and the identity. And of course, I'm writing all the groups in this form by the correspondence to them because every subgroup of G mod N is a form. In uh, M1 mod N, right? And M1 is normal, M1 mod N is normal in G mod N, if and only if M1 is normal in G. So now we get this. If these quotients are simple, you're done. Repeat the process, right? So just keep breaking it up into the simple pieces, and this terminates as G is fine. Do I understand how we're breaking that down? Uh, what else did you say? Every refinement of a solvable series is a solvable series. Well, let's suppose for the next statement, Solvable series. Now let's refine it. <laughs> so what we know is for the Y is GI times GI plus one is billion. Now assume that we can put another group in here such that. Of course, GI plus one is normal in GI, so it's going to be normal in N. That's automatic. Uh, and suppose N is normal in uh, uh, GI, right? Now, look at GI mod N. Um, and let's look at that. N. Suffices to show that these two are abelian. Can anybody explain why this is abelian? Any subgroup in the building that can deal with it. What about G mod G I mod N? Here is something that's in N because it's the G mod Okay, right. So uh And this is any homomorphic image of an ability group is going to get it.
So it's billion. And what about the last statement? The series is a composition series if and only if it has no possible time. Yeah. Let's try that. And let's suppose we can define that. Suppose we can insert again right here. Notice that Notice that n on gi plus 1 is a normal subgroup of gi plus 1. But this is simple. Therefore, n on gi plus 1 must equal either gi on GI plus one or uh, GI plus one not GI plus one. That is to say, <coughs> this thing has to correspond either to the whole group or to the identity group, which implies that N is equal to GI plus one or two. And so you can't refine in a meaningful Shove that in back in, you see that it has to be the GI plus one group. And the converse of this is very simple. Okay. Any questions about this? Um, pay attention, especially to this one right here. G is a finite group, but G has a composition series. Um, and I'll say, why we might care about that in a moment. Let me give you the following theorem, which I think I think you said that you had seen uh, solvability before, but you saw it in terms of series, right? Yes. Well, uh, here, here's the theorem that ties this. So some of you that may have seen salt before might have seen it defined in terms of these series, right? Um, how about this graph? Suppose we have solvable. So you look at the derived series. And remember these uh, these superscripted numbers in parentheses means the derived. So this is the commutator subgroup of G, and this is the commutator subgroup of the commutator subgroup of G, and so forth and so on. The group is solvable doing the sequence of operations in a finite number of steps gets you the identity, right? And this is a solvable series. As a G I or G I plus one is G. Because I don't care what this is, this is its commutator subgroup. And when you take any group and you modify the commutator subgroup, you get the field. So this is a solvable series. How about the other direction? Suppose G has a solvable series. So we'll 
we'll start with so I'm going to talk so our first one contains C1 contains C2 Um, now, here's the key. Notice that Notice that because of the fact this is a soft series, this mod disk has to be a billion, which means uh, that, oops, I got this thing around. Uh, it means that G1 must contain functions. You can proceed like this since. One my G two is a billion, which means that uh, G two contains the commutator subgroup G one. I must see what this one is. But this contains uh, G1, so G2 contains the second commutator circuit and so forth. In general, so hopefully you all see that this is kind of an easy inductive argument. This is keep the same argument going here. You have the GN. Contains or is let me turn around here. Oh, you can see this. Or she didn't contain um, subgroup, but this terminates in the identity, therefore. Okay, so I'm going to give you uh, this last result here. This is the Jordan Holden theorem. Uh, and I'm going to give it to you without proof. Actually, I'll, I'll talk you through it a little bit. And uh, this is why we care about these composition series. And it motivates, this theorem sort of, in a sense, motivates one of the most important sort of algebra problems ever, and that's the classification theorem of finite simple groups. So uh, without further ado, we need to this You know, you're just a cool person if you've got them all up in your name. I should put some in my sort of mind. Uh, any two composition series here are equivalent. And what do I mean by that? I mean the same length. So the length of any composition series that you can come up with for a group D is the same. And the composition factors that you get are isomorphic up to rearrangement. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. Uh, hence, uh, so if G is Composition 
Well, A5 itself is simple, is it not? Right? So, and my list is A5. I guess the length of this is one, actually, even though it looks like there's two groups here because we start our indexing at zero. Right? So, this is G0 and G1. S5. Well, what you would get here is S5, A5, and this is really the only way to go because the only non trivial normal subgroup I've got is S5 and A5. So I'm kind of stuck, and then A5 is simple. This produces a list of two groups in this order. And these are the factors S5 mod A5 and A5 mod. Uh, D5 well D5 has only one non-trivial normal subgroup it's isomorphic to C5 which is the, just the cycle for the pentagon uh, and one. And my list of simple groups here will be C2 and C5. Now, this list of simple groups is not enough to completely determine the group. So here's another. Uh, and this is kind of a fun example. Look at Z10. Now, Z10, on the other hand, is uh, it's not Z5, uh, it's not D5, but it's the same size, right? It's got 10 elements. Actually, I can think of two composition series here, and this sort of illustrates George Holt. Because this has, this is a cyclic group, and it's got a cyclic subgroup of four to five, which is certainly normal, right? This has got a cyclic subgroup of four to two. Now look at those composition series. These are both composition series. The top one, the quotient Z5, uh, Z10 mod Z2 is cyclic of four to five, so that's certainly simple. And the quotient Z2 mod one is also simple. The second one looks different, right? Z10 mod Z5, Z2, and Z5 mod 1 is this. But notice these two series have the same length as predicted by Jordan Holder, <coughs> and they've got the same composition factors. They're just in different orders. The list here is this one Z5, Z2, and the list here is the same in a different order. This quotient and this quotient. Okay, so this example illustrates a couple of, I think, important things. Number one, uh, there's usually more than one way to do a composition series, right? And that's what makes Jordan Holder interesting. Is the composition series is not unique. It's only unique up to length and the, the quotients it produces, right? So there's two examples. And here's another thing. Z10 produces a list of simple groups, Z2 and Z5, and so does D5, even though... Actually, D5 only produces in one order, whereas Z10 has got the freedom to do it in more than one order. Right. So, the moral of the story is this is a powerful theorem, but it doesn't tell you quite everything. Because this list of simple groups, if I just give you this list of simple groups, you can say, well, how can I make a group out of this? 
Well, in this case, I can put them together as a direct product, and I'll get that. Or I can put them together as more exotic semi direct product and get this. But uh, let me point out. Let's do one QA. By the way, uh, anybody know what we should have here? So the order of QA is, is QA, right? And so I need to find a normal subgroup. Now, it, I mean, the CELO theorem is actually telling me that this should have a normal subgroup of one form, correct? And that makes sense, right? Because the functions would then be of order two, right? And we want a simple function. We can't have a, we can't have a simple group of order like either four or eight. So it would have to be a normal subgroup of one four, all the elements of order two. Need a little bit more. Actually, you've got several choices. Actually, I think there's three subgroups of order four. I'm going to pick one, okay? And here's one I'm going to pick. I'm just going to write everything down. Uh, one minus one I minus I. And now I need a subgroup here. Uh, what do you suppose my next subject is going to be? Yeah, one minus one. And then, yeah. So, order four, order two, order one. Notice my choice here of picking I and minus I was, was arbitrary. I could have gone J. At this point right here, it branches out three different ways. You could do the I's, the J's, or the K's, right? But then when you get down here and here, you're kind of forced. The list of simple groups that you get here are this quotient, this quotient, and this quotient. So the length is 0, 1, 2, 3, and its list of simple groups are 0, 1, 2, 3. Uh, I know another group is, is like that, uh, and that should be 0. In fact, I think that if you look at any abelian group or that, it also has that case as well. Um, in fact, the only one that's different, I think, is the dihedral group with the little. Uh, no, no, it's that will also. Yes, that. So let me point out that for any group of order A, yeah, for any group of order A, you'll get these different groups. But their their quotient will all be three of them in that order. So they're going to go eight, four, two, one, like that. But all five of them are different, even though they have the, the same thing. And all the abelian ones you can put together as direct products, depending on what the groups are. And the non-abelian from dihedral group, you can take one of the subgroups and put it together as a semi-direct product, but it won't be completely like this. And the quaternion group is not a semi-direct product of its proper subgroup at all. So okay. Any questions? Well, so that kind of concludes uh, a rather lengthy uh, part of this course talking about groups. Uh, now, now I guess it's more fun, right? Fact, from this point on, of course, you may refer to me reverently as Sauron, because from now on, we are going to master the rings 
We're not going to get any to the stupid elves. We're going to keep them all for ourselves. So, what is a win? Well, five one one. Um, so here's the idea. Um, groups are incredibly important. Uh, in, in particular, often the group theory is referred to as a theory of symmetry. Uh, and we saw a lot of that there. But one of the first things that we notice, perhaps, is there's two things that we can do in the integers, right? I mean, the integers are kind of the prototype for us for everything, right? I mean, it, it's where we start it off. And what can you do with the integers? Well, you can add, right? Okay, so we've got a billion group there. But you can also multiply, right? Now, the beginnings of multiplication is just a fancy shorthand for adding. Like two times three is just adding three to itself two times, or two to itself three times, right? But then you have the natives, what does that mean? And, you know, there, there is this sort of thing that seems different called multiplication. Rings are basically a billion groups where you also have a way to multiply. So, Ring, uh, which I want to know R ring plus in time. So I'm actually going to have two binary operations uh, addition multiplication in a non empty set. Yeah, binary operations. And I'll probably write a little dot for times for a little while, and then once we get used to it, I'll kind of drop it. Uh, satisfying. So, as usual, we want our operations to behave themselves in a certain sense. Okay, so. This is just stuff that we've already covered. R plus is a billion group, right? In fact, that's the group of a million group. Um, and now everything else is designed so that the two operations play together, right? right? First of all, this other operation, this multiplication, I want it to be associated, right? A times. B times C equals A times, whoops, A times B times C, not all A, B. Uh, there are crazy people that do things that aren't associated, right? You just don't want to end up on their mailing list. Uh, yeah, that's, that's crazy stuff there, because that gets out of hand. In fact, usually people that do non associative algebra. It's not completely lost on this associativity. So something will happen like A times B times C is minus A times B times C or something like that. There'll be some kind of correction factor very often, but not always. And number two, or number C, I want to make sure that uh, multiplication and addition play together. Play together well. Like, you suppose that's enough? Yeah, you gotta. So, so what I've dealt with here is I know that they play together well if A hits B plus C on the left side. I better take care of the right as well. What if A hits this thing on the right? I want it to behave as well. So that's it, right? You've got a billion group under addition. You've got this other operation that's associative and it, it distributes, it plays nicely with the addition. Notice that the addition is, is superior in the sense it's got more going for it. 
right? Um, there is, because this is a varying group, there's a magic number zero in the ring that when you add anything to it, it leaves it alone, right? And any element of the ring must have a negative because it's a varying group. We don't know any such thing <coughs> about multiplication operation. It's, it, it's a little bit more wild west. We're not quite sure what's going on there. Let me add to this definition a little bit. If yeah. uh, all A, B, and R, A times B equals B times A, we say R is B. Yeah, I know it's kind of weird. The group we call it chameleon, the reason we call it chameleon, but. Um, a commuted ring is one where the order of multiplication doesn't matter. And for example, if you have a commuted ring here, this makes this one superfluous. And if there exists one R, sometimes I'll just write one in the more lazy, when I get lazy later, and <coughs> R such that. So if there is this, this magic element that when you multiply uh, any element by it and leave it alone, then R will be arranged without the Now, in my particular research, I am a commuted valve press. So I usually assume it brings commuted one. Which do you think is the more serious assumption? Right? Which one buys me more? Actually, it is. I think most people would think, oh, your life is much easier if everything commutes. And that's certainly true. But there's many shocking examples in rings. And, I, and when we get to ideals a little bit, I'll show you an example of how bad things can be. If you remove, it seems pretty innocuous, but if you remove the identity, it's true that there are some little theorems that are easy, but there's a lot of kind of standard things that just go way out the window when you don't have a one in the ring. It's actually just a value. So let me give you kind of a first theorem. It's kind of some basics, if you will, about what behavior of a ring. What are the ring? Um, number one, zero times A equals A times zero equals zero, all A and R. And the zero element is, of course, the identity of the abelian group under of, of R under addition. Number B, or number two, minus A times B equals A times minus B minus B. So minus A B for all. Minus A minus B is AB for all A, B, and R. Four, if A, B, R, and N, C, uh, then And let me make clear what I mean by this. What is n times a? So 
So for a positive integer, three, say, three times a means just add a to the subject. It is. Minus a minus a absolute value of n times so n up to zero and if it's zero right so adding a to itself zero times I want to find zero. And finally, if I wanted to get some AI, If I multiply this out, then this is the sum of AI. Okay, I encourage you all to uh, go through this and try to prove it. it. It's pretty straightforward. I think it's a good kind of beginning exercise. Um, how many of you have ever heard of the term zero value? All uh, heard of that? Okay, so we'll talk about that last time. I'll show you what a left and a right zero value are and how they can uh, differ a little bit, maybe than what you would Any questions? Any questions, y'all? Okay, so. Do me a big fat favor and remind me. I want to. I want to send myself an email now. Remind me about our review session on Saturday at ten o'clock. We will meet here. Hopefully, we find an unopened classroom, and if not, we'll just roll on up the block. Okay. Okay. Any questions out there? All right. We'll see y'all next time. Sir, yes. First, you then go up to raise.